on July 18th, 2019, at 10.30 a.m. Japanese Standard Time. Kyoto Animation, or more popularly known as KyoAni's, first studio caught fire due to an arson attack. The blaze killed 34 people, and another 35 were injured, out of a company that employs less than 150. I feel obligated to talk about this, because I haven't really been interested or a fan of KyoAni's work in recent years, but they've still produced some of my all-time favorite shows. They've adapted some of my all-time favorite stories. Shows I still love. Shows I still revisit when I want to watch anime in my free time. There's so much raw talent at this company, from animators, directors, to even executives who I feel legitimately cared. Not just about their staff or bottom line, but about the products they put out. I can't talk about KyoAni without mentioning this tragedy, or pretending why it isn't what's spurring me to do this video. You'll have to forgive me if this video is a bit light on my usual flippant humor, but I don't think this is the time for it. Chances are, you too have watched some of these anime, and I thought I would do a retrospective on some of these shows, ones that are near and dear to me. Not because it's popular or beneficial for me but because it's long overdue. I want to show my love for a studio that has given so much to me. This is a KyoAni retrospective, from the perspective of a fan. In 1981, a former Mushi Pro staff member left the company and moved to Kyoto, Japan shortly after marrying. It was a humble start to the couple's marriage, and at the time, no one could have foreseen the significance of this simple act, but it would eventually go down in animation history. Both husband and wife held a passion for animation and publishing, and the two founded a company that would grow to shape an industry. One that endeavored to challenge, innovate, and create high quality works above all else. That person was Hata Yoko, and her husband, Hata Hideaki. The studio they founded was simply known as Kyoto Animation. The two strove to build a company that would produce works that transcended borders. Beyond the city of Kyoto, past the seas surrounding Japan, and perhaps span the globe. Content that would shatter cultural barriers, speaking to people from all walks of life on a deeper level through their animation. To build a close-knit family with their workers, becoming a studio that gave women a voice in an industry with underrepresentation and a cultural bias against their abilities. But above all else, they wanted a place that would promote growth in its employees, a company that would foster talent and allow it to excel. It's common in the anime production sphere for most animators and production staff to be freelance, moving from studio to studio, hunting for their next job. But KyoAni broke the norm. To allow their animators an environment where they could grow, the company made an effort to keep its people around as salaried employees. This had two effects. It let them nurture talent and provide reprieve from the grind of worrying about the next job. Effectively, it let the staff focus on their work, improving their skills, and strive for the best they could be. Quality over quantity. And the studio benefited by producing visually astounding, narratively compelling, and emotionally touching shows that propelled them to acclaim by 1999, the studio had officially become a full-fledged corporation, having cut their chops on shows with other studios such as Inuyasha, Kitty Grade, and Tenchi Universe. It was time to branch out into something new. It was time to put their skills to the test. It was time to produce a work entirely on their own. One of the first anime produced by KyoAni I watched was an adaptation of a key visual novel called Air. I don't know how many people outside of the key fan circle remember this show, but I still quite like it. The game was a top seller in its day, so an anime adaptation was likely, though it took around five years for that to come to fruition. The visual novel came out in 2000, and the anime didn't come out until 2005. Looking back, the studio had a lot riding on this production. An anime adaptation of a high-ranking visual novel for two years straight, topping sales charts when it was released, and a relatively unknown studio getting the project. 
This could have been a make or break situation for Kyoani. They didn't just stick the landing, they demolished it. It's a touching story about a girl who dreams of flying. She meets a magician who puts on a puppet show with magic, and the two form a close bond. The more the girl dreams, the worse her health becomes due to an ancient curse, which blends magic and reality, a common theme in key stories. It's the epitome of a dramatic romance, showing not necessarily realistic characters, but certainly likable ones that draw you in. The animation for this series is top notch. This was 2005, when what we consider Moe was still taking shape. It reminds me exactly why I fell in love with this studio, and key shows in particular. Character designs are definitely exaggerated and rough, but this was the studio's second outing on its own, with a first time series director, Ishihara Tatsuya, behind the wheel. It shows that the company was willing to take risks from the start, and ambition was strong with this project as there was a heavy focus on artistic visuals to convey abstract emotion, rather than having the seiyus do all the work. Sweeping camera movements, dramatic angles, and a beautiful score that evokes the feeling of a scene perfectly. Music definitely elevates the already stunning visuals, using the visual novel soundtrack to great effect by the production staff. Revisiting this show just screams to me how much the medium was elevated on an artistic level specifically the television side of anime production. Camera movements this dynamic were usually reserved for movies, and art of this caliber was rarely seen in a single core show. This became something of a trademark, and it's easy to see why they stood out in the market. I still love this series. Even if it's overly dramatic and the character models don't quite hold up, it's little more than a footnote in the studio's portfolio by this point but it still set a trend for what we would see in the coming years. And this was just the start of a beautiful partnership between Ki and Kyoani. Where would Kyoani go from their previous success? After stunning audiences with air, they needed another big hit to secure their place as an animation studio. And while they had shown promise, their next big project would absolutely destroy expectations. And in April of 2006, a cornerstone of animation and cultural history was laid when they released the anime adaptation of the highly successful and critically acclaimed light novel series, The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. Haruhi was already a household name by the time the anime was under development, selling millions of copies. The first novel had won the grand prize of the Sneaker Awards, and riding that wave of success, Kyoani secured the rights for the series showing they had the animation talent to bring fantastical elements to life, while also an uncanny ability to make mundanity interesting through unique presentation and framing. Through their work, they elevated one of the most popular light novel series of its time to the most popular anime in Japan. But that was only the beginning. With the rise in use of the internet, Haruhi saw success in spreading across Asia, and even to the Western English-speaking world. Cementing it as not just a popular show, but as a bona fide cultural phenomenon. The plot of Haruhi isn't grand in scope or visually impressive. Much of the story can be written off as coincidence or imagination, which puts the animators and director in a tight spot to make the ordinary visually interesting while conveying the subtleties that make a good mystery. This allowed the animators to flex their muscles in an area they shine most. Characters. The amount of detail in each, compared to the work they did on air just a year earlier, is impressive. But beyond that, there's a clear approach to further the cinematic aesthetic with highly expressive models, vibrant colors, fantastically fluid movements, and cinematography that would tell the story unto itself. They needed to capture scope, closeness, and comfortableness and excitement visually with a commonplace setting. While their work to this point would make me mildly impressed, this was the series I fell in love with the studio. I think it's safe to assume that without such an exceptional adaptation, Haruhi wouldn't be as popular as it is, and I don't think as many people would be enjoying anime in the West. Coming fresh off the heels of one of the most recognizable and celebrated anime in the world, Kyoani still wasn't satisfied. They endeavored to do something practically unheard of at the time. And that 
was to do an anime adaptation of another popular key visual novel, Kanon. You see, Kanon already had an anime adaptation by Toei Animation in 2002. It has a distinctly 2000s Toei Animation vibe when looking at it today, but the same animators behind Air wanted to try and rectify the somewhat lackluster attempt. So with the same director from Air and Haruhi, a KyoAni adaptation was released in 2006. If you enjoyed the animation in Air, it's been refined here, effectively perfecting the Moe genre by this point. Characters, setting, scope. Everything the Toei adaptation didn't have was breathed into this one, bringing it to life. Aesthetically, this is the more appealing option. It's also a more faithful adaptation to the original visual novel, but that's not to say they ignored the fans of the Toei version. Almost the entire original cast was brought back to reprise their roles. The biggest, but least noticed change would be the length. Much of the plot is cut from the Toei version, having only a 13 episode run, but the KyoAni version was a two core show, allowing side characters more room to develop, further enriching the show's world. It let their stories be told how they should have been told, making a much more complete and heartfelt experience. This is very much a classic Key animation, and the one that springs to mind for many people when talking about Key's work, but I feel most anime fans, at least in the West, wouldn't know Key without KyoAni. The two companies are almost a match made in heaven, with Key providing excellent music and heart-wrenching stories, and KyoAni able to bring those stories to life through excellent animation that fits the theme and music so well. For those who aren't sure, this was a massive risk for the company. Kanon was a visual novel released in 1999, and had an anime adaptation already made. This didn't need done, and could have easily backfired if not handled with the utmost care. Not only did they have an original source material to be compared to, but another, larger studio's anime. And in that light, I respect this, because it didn't feel like a cash grab or just another anime made. With everything to lose and so little to gain, this feels like a passion project. One that didn't just fade into the ether, but supplanted the older adaptation's place as the de facto version. Having struck animation gold with air, defied expectations by readapting Kanon, and defined a generation of the industry with Haruhi, what more could KyoAni do that they hadn't already in the few short years since they started solo producing content? The answer came in yet another massively successful property that was utterly destroying the 4 coma market, Lucky Star. Lucky Star was a 4 coma manga that had already skyrocketed in popularity in Japan, with its first volume selling out almost immediately upon release, so much so that a rushed second print was ordered. By the time an anime adaptation was being worked on, the series had lofty expectations to meet, a fanbase ready to tear it to shreds if it wasn't good. This was another popular work with some severe limitations on its premise that required ingenuity and cleverness to work around. That's not to say there weren't any issues with the production, however. Yamamoto Yutaka was brought on as the director for this series, but his structured style didn't fit the tone of the source. In a genre where gags only last four panels, stretching out an entire conversation to cover ten minutes just destroys the comedic pacing. And by episode four, Takemoto Yasuhiro, the director of Full Metal Panic, replaced Yamamoto as the director. There's an abrupt pacing shift in the series at that point, which is refreshing as it lets the fast-paced humor shine. The series doesn't have a plot to speak of. It's more of a premise with solid characters that work off one another to create comedic situations. Just a group of high school girls talking about video games, manga, anime, light novels, and Japanese pop culture in general. So the gauntlet is thrown on how to turn that into a visually stimulating experience. How does one make people talking about and engaging in otaku culture engaging? And this is where I think the true genius of the staff at KyoAni shines. Looking at Lucky Star, any given scene, the characters are surprisingly animated for anime. The simplistic art style and flat pastel color palette 
allow the staff to pack more movement into the series. Characters are constantly shifting their heads, moving hands, changing orientation, which gives you something to watch, and where many other 4 coma anime in the same vein dropped the ball, I feel, when KyoAni made Lucky Star. They didn't just adapt a popular manga, they kicked off an entire slice of life comedy craze, spawning countless imitators looking to be Lucky Star. They essentially set what a comedy anime is for the next decade, with fans still looking back on this series as the gold standard for the slice of life genre. After a year and a half of heavy hitters, Kyoani would go on to tackle their last key visual novel adaptation to date. If you've seen or played a key property, this is probably the one you've experienced. In the fall of 2007, Kyoani released a masterclass in animation, cinematography, and storytelling in the form of Clannad. Clannad is a visual novel has seen multiple releases since its original publication, with versions appearing on PC and game consoles, each consistently reaching the higher end in terms of sales rankings. This is often ranked in the top B shoujo visual novels of all time, containing an emotional, personal story on each of the branching paths. But with an anime adaptation, there was only one clear route to go. Having honed their craft from air to canon, Clannad demonstrates just how great animation can be. The way the camera moves through a scene, the focus of the shots, the detail and expressions. It takes everything in the previous works and ups them to 11. The first season focuses mostly on the supporting cast, leading to a lot of cute moments for the sake of it. But ultimately, I think this is what gets the audience invested in the characters. It shows they're not just balls of sadness that need to be protected, but have quirks and appeal so they can be built up as individuals. I don't know if I can even put into words how beautiful this entire production is. It's one of my favorite series of all time. With Air and Kanon, the bittersweet elements felt forced into the story for the sake of conflict. Almost a cheap appeal to the audience's feelings, if you will. But whereas those are romance stories with a few tragic elements, Clannad is a romance tragedy roller coaster that knows how to follow characters through their highs and lows. The music, voice acting, and cinematography all convey and reinforce those respective moments to drive home the feelings into the audience. These are characters I feel anyone can connect with, due to their flaws that make them feel relatable and real. If anyone is looking to get into a more serious anime, break out of the comedy and shonen genres that are standouts in the medium, I often tell them to look at this one. Having spent almost a year on Clannad with two seasons between parts, the studio looked to get more in touch with what its modern audiences would consider its roots. Tackling a moderately successful 4 coma manga, Kaon. It debuted in spring of 2009 and effectively solidified the slice of life moe genre of cute girls doing cute things. Following a cast of high school girls slacking off in a club centered around music while rarely playing a single note, new director Yamada Naoko, a key animator on air and episode director on Clannad, is finally getting a chance to head a project with this series. This is where the company culture of promoting from within shines most, and she definitely has talent. Whereas the animation and cinematography were defining characteristics of many of the shows I've talked about thus far, Kaon challenges that notion by putting a greater emphasis on style and character movements. The camera's more static, the eyes aren't as detailed, and movements are more realistic, but it's much in the vein of Lucky Star before it. However, this series takes the backgrounds to another level, giving it a more detailed look. The world of Kaon feels alive compared to Lucky Star. Of the series I've covered thus far, this would be the least impressive from a technical standpoint. While the animation is good, characters move well, and specifically faces and expressions are gorgeous. Coming from the work the studio had created before this, it feels distinctly different. The cast is much more plain, akin to realistic schoolgirls. The setting is entirely ordinary, and the extravagant elements or cutaways are gone. That might sound like a negative, but I think that's actually what makes this one stand out among the library. Much of the work preceding Kaon is polished to the point of perfection, but this series has character in how simplistic and rough it appears. 
The sketched look of the character's face feels more raw and impactful while imbuing the scene with personality. While k might not be the best show out there, its cultural impact and trends set are significant. This is pretty much the progenitor of Moe's slice of life, where comedy is there, but not the main draw. The characters are the best part of this series, how they interact and play off one another. And others seem to agree, since k was a massive financial success, spawning a second season and a movie with fans still remembering it fondly to this day. After adapting a number of 4 coma manga, their next major project was tackling a comedy manga with a decent following. In spring of 2011, Kyoani unleashed their animation department on Nichijo, with returning director Tatsuya Ishihara once more. Doing this retrospective, the story of Kyoani's animation is almost the story of this man's career. Nichijou was a moderately successful manga series running from 2008 to 2015, characterized by its off-the-wall humor. KyoAni was probably the best studio that could have handled this adaptation, given their already extensive credentials. But this series lacks much of the distinct style one would usually associate with KyoAni. Taking a muted color palette and using rough line work to convey the manga roots was genius in giving this series a unique voice. Further, the movements and detail put into the gags, turning a simple slice-of-life scenario like walking to school into an action-packed over-the-top stream of movements and actions, sets the tone well. I've already mentioned before that you can sort of tell when a project is a passion piece for the staff working on it, and Nichijo was certainly one of those. This series' mere existence spits in the face of all of those who scoff at the animation quality in a comedy anime. And I feel that's part of the joke in itself, that the humor here is not just in keeping with the manga, but showing that even a light-hearted comedy show can still flex its animation muscles when given the chance, though most just opt to do so in less obvious ways. Unfortunately, Nichijo was not a commercial success for the studio, failing to meet projections with abysmal Blu-ray sales, which is a shame. This is one of my all-time favorite comedy shows, for its perfect understanding of setup, escalation, delivery. On top of that, the loving work put into animating it. Which makes me appreciate this series even more. This isn't a comprehensive list of shows produced by KyoAni, and I didn't even touch on all the works I've watched or enjoyed. Hell, I didn't even touch on Chunibyo, Free, Kobayashi-san, or Violet Evergarden. But the reason I made this was to offer some perspective. For people who don't get why this fire was a big deal to anime fans, or why KyoAni was such a juggernaut in the industry, it's not just that they're an animation studio. It's not that they make moe trash that the mindless masses will buy. It's not because I'm a fanboy and felt the need to strike while the iron's hot. It's because KyoAni is, and always has been, an innovative force for anime. They produce shows that have impacted so many during their formative years laid the bedrock for entire genres, and set standards for what animation could be. I don't think everyone should be a fan of their work, or has to like these or other shows they produce, but hopefully you've gained some appreciation for what these series mean to others, and the industry as a whole. Hey, you made it to the end of the video! Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and do all that other YouTube stuff, because that really helps me out. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Phil Corona for making this video possible. Thanks for watching.